let's take a look at the single index model. The single index model is an approach for simplifying the portfolio analysis process. Now in traditional mean variance analysis, you calculate the expected return of the portfolio is just a weighted average of the expected returns for the securities held in the portfolio. So WI is a weight. It's the weight or the percentage of the portfolio that stock I or security I makes up. So if you have a $100,000 portfolio and 10,000 is invested in IBM stock, then IBM makes up 10% of the portfolio. So the weight here is 10%. Down here, we have the portfolio standard deviation, and actually in turn, inside the brackets here is the uh, variance for the portfolio. We've taken the square root or raised it to the one half power, so we have the standard deviation here. What are we going to need? We're going to need the variance for each individual security's returns. The problem here is that we're going to need the covariance or correlation between each pair of securities. And sigma i, which is the standard deviation of i, times sigma j, which is the standard deviation of j, times the times rho i j, which is the correlation between i and j, turns out to be the covariance between i and j. So sometimes you'll see this written as w i w j sigma i j, which is the notation for covariance. It turns out there's going to be a lot of pairs here. And you see this double summation sign, which can be a bit intimidating for some people. But it's just a counter. And it just tells you to add up these things, change the counter and add up. And we've noted in the second summation that j does not equal i. If j equals i, then you get this term here. You get this variance term. But we wanted to separate that out. So, if you think about it, you know, in the first case, uh, i equals 1, j equals 2. So you have sigma 1, or I'm sorry, uh, w1 times w2 times sigma 1 times sigma 2 times rho 1, 2. And you do that. You keep changing the numbers. And then you would have 3, 3, 2, and then 4, 2. And then you would have, you know, 1, 3. And you would have all these different combinations. Well, it turns out that using this Markowitz full variance covariance model requires a large number of inputs. So for an n stock portfolio, we need n times n minus 1 divided by two different covariance or correlation terms. So for a 100 stock portfolio, this is going to be 4,950 uh, covariance or correlation terms. And in addition, we're going to need 100 expected returns and 100 variance terms for a total of 5,150 inputs. And this is really a staggering number of inputs for a fairly modestly sized portfolio. Okay? A lot of mutual funds have well over 100 stocks in them. They may have three, four, five hundred. 500. They may have uh, 1,000 stocks, for that matter, in there. Okay? Is there a way to simplify this process? Well, William F. Sharp, most noted for his development of the capital asset pricing model, for which he won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1990, developed this single index model. And basically, instead of using a direct relationship between each pair of securities to find their covariance or correlation, he found the relationship through their relationship to some index. And he starts by laying out this equation here, that ri equals alpha i plus beta i rm. And if we do a little bit of manipulation, I mean, this can be just a basic regression equation. And if we do a little bit of statistical uh, manipulation, we take the expected value of that term. The expected value of ri equals alpha i. And the reason for that is alpha is a constant. And if you take the expected value of a constant, it's just the constant. The expected value of 3 is still 3. 
and then beta i is also a constant, so you take the expected value of that, you get beta i times the expected return of the market. Okay, Doing a little more sophisticated statistical manipulation, which I'm not going to do here, you get the variance for i is beta i squared times the variance of the market plus the variance of the error term. Okay, Essentially, this is a noise type uh, um, variance. Okay, You're going to have an error term, and that's going to have a variance as well. And the covariance between i and j is beta i times beta j times the variance of the market. Okay, So if you calculated the beta for the first stock and the beta for the second stock, and you know the variance for the market, you can figure out what the covariance between that those uh, between one and two are. So to do portfolio analysis, we need a portfolio beta, and that's just a weighted average of the betas of the stocks held in the portfolio. We're going to need an alpha for the portfolio, also just a weighted average of the alphas in the portfolio. So it turns out that the expected return for the portfolio is just alpha for the portfolio plus beta for the portfolio times the expected return of the market. And the variance for the portfolio is just going to be the beta for the portfolio squared times the variance of the market, okay, plus a bunch of these uh, terms that relate to the variance of the error term. If we assume that we have an equally weighted portfolio, then WI equals 1 over N. So if we have a 100 stock portfolio, each stock is 1% of the portfolio. So I've taken the equation we saw on the last slide, and this first term is the same, and I've substituted 1 over N for the WI. So we had WI squared, which would be 1 over N squared, because there's no i in here in the ends, you can take one of the ends out. And it turns out that as n goes to infinity, okay, as n gets bigger and bigger, right, what happens to this? This goes closer and closer to zero, and zero times anything is zero. So essentially, this term disappears. So we can get the portfolio risk and return as the expected return for the portfolio we already discussed, and the variance for the portfolio is simply the portfolio beta squared times the variance of the market. Okay, That's for a, um, an equally weighted portfolio that has a lot of securities in it. All right, If we were to do this for perhaps a smaller portfolio, to conduct this analysis, we're going to need n betas so we can calculate the portfolio beta. We're going to need n alphas so we can calculate the portfolio alpha. And then we would be able to calculate um, the expected return for the portfolio. And we're going to have n variance of the error terms. Okay? We'll also need the expected return of the market and the variance of the market. So we need 3n plus 2 inputs. So for a 100 stock portfolio, we only need 302 inputs rather than the 5,150 inputs for the full Markowitz variance covariance analysis. What's the intuition here? The intuition is that instead of needing to find the relationship between every pair of stock returns, we can find the relationship through some market index. So let's take a look at a little picture here. Suppose we have four stocks in our portfolio, A, B, C, and D. If we directly paired them, we would have to find the relationship between A and B. So that would be our first pair. Then we would have to find the relationship between A and C. That would be our second um, input. We'd have to find the relationship between A and D. That's our third. Then we have B and C, B and D, and C and D. So there are six of these that we have to pair off. If we use the single index model, what happens is, is that 
we find A's relationship to the index, we find B's relationship to the index, C's relationship to the index, and D's relationship to the index, and then we can infer any possible combinations. We can infer, you know, B with A, we can infer B with C, uh, A with D, through this index. And while this seems like a sort of a new concept, this idea has been around for a long time, okay? This logic's been used by the phone company. Think about it. If the phone company had to run one phone line to your house, or one phone line out of your house to every possible person you would call, how many wires would be coming out of your house? There would be thousands, perhaps millions of lines coming out of your house directly connecting to the house across the street and to your grandmother's house across town and to the store you want to call and to your office. What do they do? No, they connect everybody to some central computer and that central computer connects you to everybody else. It's much more efficient. Okay, airlines have done the same thing. Uh, you may have had to connect for a flight. That's the hub and spoke approach that they've taken. If they had to connect every city together, if an airline had to connect New York to Philadelphia, New York to, Cal uh, to Los Angeles, New York to San Francisco, New York to Chicago, that's a lot of connections. Instead, they tend to have hubs. And you fly into a hub, and the hub is connected to all of the cities they serve. So if you're fortunate enough to live near a hub, you can oftentimes get a direct flight to the city of your choice. All right, I, I happen to live in the uh, New York metropolitan area, and um, Newark Airport is a hub for, uh, well, it used to be a hub for Continental Airlines, uh, and you could fly directly to just about anywhere. Um, other airlines have hubs in Dallas or in Atlanta, Chicago. United is, uh, I believe, in Chicago. Okay, the airlines have all merged together, so I can't keep track of, of who's, which airline is with which airline, but you can get direct flights if you're there. Okay, Federal Express does the same thing, that overnight delivery. They fly all their packages into Memphis, and then they sort them there, and then they fly them back to the cities. Rather than connecting one city to one city to one city, they all connect to the hub. And that's a much more efficient way to do this. And that's basically what the single index model does.